In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In the Last Days television program with myself, Martin Blackham. Natalie's behind the scenes today, but she says hello. This is the program that looks Israel. We look at the news and we look at what's going on in current affairs. We also look at the Hebraic roots. And today we're looking at the work of the Israeli Defense Forces. That's the Israeli army here in Israel. And uh, for our viewers in the UK, we've got a special treat. We have uh, Sergeant uh, Benjamin Anthony from our soldiers speak. Great to have you with us. Thank, Thank you so you much. Me. Thank you so much for coming across. Even though he's originally from the United Kingdom and, uh, and uh, from uh, Leeds, from those uh, of our viewers, we know there's a lot of you in Yorkshire. Um, even though he's from the United Kingdom, you're actually spending a lot of time uh, in the United States with your work. So it's uh, great to have him now on British Christian Television on Revelation TV. So fantastic. Um, so. Uh, to introduce him, he is the uh, CEO and um, director and founder of um, uh, Our Soldiers Speak. And uh, as I say, he's originally from um, Leeds in Yorkshire. And he has uh, a mission to go to uh, campuses, to go around uh, the world, really, speaking about the work of the IDF. Um, and uh, you've served in different campaigns. You've served in the... Uh, Second Lebanon War in 2006, Operation Pillar of Defense, Operation Protective Edge, which many of you may remember we covered from here. Uh, he served in Judea and Samaria and in, on Israel's northern border. And he's also, he serves on an annual basis as a combat reservist in the IDF. Uh, he's been featured in the Times of Israel, the Jewish Press, Breaking News Israel, and the Al Gemeinde News. And uh, great to have you with us. So maybe you can just introduce yourself how the organization started and many of our, our, our audience will be are, um, helping to promote Israel. So they'll be very interested how you, how you started the organization and a little bit about yourself. So with pleasure. Thank you again for having me and for hosting. It's a great privilege to be here. I, as you mentioned, born, raised, educated in the United Kingdom to the degree that I am educated. And I studied history, literature and politics at the University of Manchester. I enrolled in those studies during the events of the Second Intifada. And as you know, and as Which your viewers the, know, that was a wave right. of dreadful Palestinian Arab terror launched against the citizens of the states of Israel. And I was a student campaigner at that time and became deeply alarmed and troubled by the idea that came about whereby no matter how many buses were detonated or restaurants turned into killing fields or people killed in the course of frankly undertaking the perfectly ordinary, there seemed to be near total unanimity behind the idea that the states of Israel had no right to defend its citizens in the wake of that sustained series of terror attacks. That caused me to question the viability of the Jewish community writ large, not only in the UK, but indeed in Europe. And as a consequence of that, I made a beeline directly upon graduation for the State of Israel. I was drafted shortly so thereafter. Aliyah. I made Aliyah and I was drafted shortly thereafter. And as you which mentioned, everybody, which everybody does, is that right? Who's coming here and, and makes Aliyah? And that's quite a, that's the norm to. No, that's to... not correct, actually. Oh. It depends on a number of different factors. So, for example, there are many who make Aliyah at an age that precludes their military service upon doing so. There are many who wait until they reach an age that precludes their military service upon doing so. And there are those who ran toward it. I was somewhere in the middle. I actually was drafted into the IDF because I wished to become part of Israel. I did not move to Israel in order to be drafted. I was drafted in order to become part of Israel. And I think that today, certainly in the dynamic of male conversations, because of course we men never grow up, uh, one can never fully be part of Israeli society, even today, unless one has served in the Israel Defense Forces. You can enjoy your existence here and you can very much have a wonderful life here. But to truly understand the Israeli psyche, I believe, one has to have served and understand something 
that everybody undertook as part of the national service. And I, I think this is something maybe the viewers don't understand because when, when you actually live in the land of Israel, uh, the IDF is such, or the military and, and serving in the military is so important because it's uh, 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 very important to guard the borders and um, every family, uh, for example, you know, our neighbors and, uh, um, you know, you'll see them will be sending sons and daughters, will be coming in uniform. So this is, um, this is not something unusual, but something uh, very normal in, in Israeli society. And not just that, but the other thing you need to understand, uh, our viewers need to understand, is that uh, when people leave school, when they leave school in Israel, they, are, they go into the army. That's the norm that uh, uh, the, the children um, graduating from school will not go to university, but they'll, they'll serve in the IDF. And uh, the competition is which unit you're serving, not um, whether you will actually go into the army or the air force or the navy, but which unit you will you will spend your time in. And um, there's comp for the very um, experience, the different battalions. There's there's competition for these. Um, uh, that's what I understand. I was just reading a book um, uh, about Israel called The Startup Nation, yes. and that's uh, that. I I suddenly realised from reading The Startup Nation that. Um, that, that uh, this is the, the kind of thinking. And I, I don't think for our particular viewers in the United Kingdom realize that because at the, at the moment, uh, service for the army there is uh, obviously you have to decide to do it. It's not something um, um, compulsory. So you came across, you made Aliyah. So did you find Hebrew, was that an issue or were you okay with well, that? Just to respond to your point, first of all, what, what a lot of people fail to realize is that our citizens are our soldiers, are our citizens. Now, this is an important point because mm -hmm. it means that our actions in the field are informed by the very same standards as would the actions of any other democratic society be formed because we actually learn our principles and our viewpoints when it comes to securing the state of Israel not during the course of basic training, though there are certainly courses that deal in that. We actually learn our principles around the dinner table, learning them from our parents and from our siblings. Do not murder, do not steal, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And therefore, when this vilification of the IDF s surrounds us so vociferously as it does, that vilification is not just a critique of a particular defense force or another, that is a vilification of the citizens of the Jewish state writ large, because I repeat, our citizens are our soldiers and our soldiers are our citizens. That's the first point. And that's why we have to battle back against such criticism vehemently. The second thing that I wanted to say in response to what you mentioned is the fact that I've had the great privilege of either speaking or dispatching others to speak about service in the Israel Defense Forces. And we talk about the fact that we were drafted into several campaigns during Operation Protective Edge in 2014. I was drafted, my younger sibling, Raphael, was also drafted, and my youngest sibling, Alexander, was drafted. And indeed, my dear sister volunteered for service from the United Kingdom as well, serving 18 months as an assistant, a welfare assistant in the Israel Defense Forces. And what I try to impress upon people is that though overseas that story may be rather exceptional, what's particularly striking about it is that here in Israel, it's perfectly average. It is the story of every father and mother and brother and sister here in the States of Israel, but it needs to be told and retold. So I just wanted to express right, that. Right. So, um, so you came across and you served in the Israeli army and then you realized from your time in the United Kingdom, how important it was to speak for Israel on the campuses. No, is that I wish, right? I wish I could say that that's true, but it's, right. not, it's not correct. I wish I was that forward looking. The reality of the matter is that close to 10 years ago, myself and the other individuals from my brigade crossed back into Israel after serving in the second Lebanon war. And as we did so, I was called upon by my captain who said, Benjamin, go over there there's a reporter from the Times of London who wants a story, and you speak English, therefore you surely are qualified, <laughs> which of course is not the case, but I was the best that they had at the time. And I did go and I did interview with them, and it became very apparent to me at that point that actually nobody was speaking at that time in fluent English to an English-speaking audience about what transpires in the field, separate to politics. That launched me on a journey 
And I began to speak when I returned to the United Kingdom to undergo some studies there in synagogues. I did the rounds of the UK synagogues. And I arrived at a particular congregation in London and a very forward thinking, unlike myself, individual guided me and said, Benjamin, what you're doing here is important. But the pole of international influence and opinion that is uppermost in the list of priorities is the United States. And therefore, you must go there and begin to speak there. That's what I promptly did. I went there for what was supposed to be, I believe, a six to eight week endeavor, including speaking on university campuses. And that was when I had my eyes open to the fact that whatever I had witnessed in terms of anti-Israel sentiment on British campuses was alive, well, and growing in the campuses of the United States of America. And back then, I would say to people, you have an issue here in your campuses. And they would say, no, we don't. There's no issue in American campuses. And I said, yes, yes, you do. And because of the American outlook and the American Jewish outlook, quite frankly, I was called upon to establish an organization. And the Americans have this incredible tendency to say, not only must you continue, but we're going to facilitate the continuation of this work. And they've built us into an organization whereby we're the only organization in history that sends uniformed active officers to overseas campuses. And we've reached over 370 university campuses to date in Canada, the US, South Africa, off campus, but to students, and also in the United Kingdom. And our work is going from strength to strength as it must. Now, uh, two kind of questions come to mind. Um, the first uh, uh, question is, um, for people who are watching, we have many uh, Israel advocates, and I know that you, you email us, so I know that you're doing this, who are working on campuses or working in, in the United Kingdom uh, to speak to groups and organizations about Israel and put the Israeli point first and, and put the point of Israel when, when there's a lot of criticism. Uh, have you got any guidelines for, or, or would they be able to invite uh, our soldiers speak in the United Kingdom? Or First of all, anybody can invite us to anywhere. There are a couple of aspects to our work that are unique. Number one, as I mentioned, we're the only organization that sends uniformed officers, and we do the very same now for the Israeli National Police as well, incidentally. Number two, when we speak on campus, we speak to the pro, the anti, and the undecided alike on neutral ground, and we invite all members of the student and faculty community alike to attend. A couple of other things that I want to emphasize. We speak to the students in the language in which they wish to discuss the subject of Israel. So that means IDF lawyers to the law schools, IDF doctors to the medical schools, diplomats to the diplomacy schools, uh, journalists to the journalism schools and so forth. And finally, because the officers are on uniform, they are precluded by law from stepping into a political discourse. And that actually carries weight with the students. They realize that they can't rehash old hackneyed canards about the states of Israel that fall into the political realm, and therefore we can discuss policy. So that's very, very unique. The approach is new. We were advised against it. We find it to be the most successful means of bringing Israel's story to the world. The, the other thing that I wanted to mention in direct response to your question is, People must, in my view, and it's only my view, urgently step away from this neurosis of practicing Israel advocacy. And people will say, well, what do you mean by that precisely? The state of Israel is not a defendant that is to be cross-examined in the dock of the criminal court of public opinion. We should not be in a position, if we really wish to see self-determination and independence in our time, whereby we give people the right to question whether we deserve to exist or not. That does not happen to any other country. I am not comfortable with the idea that those who wish to support the state of Israel, and I know that they do so from a position of good, feel that they have to respond to every charge by every means and method. There should be certain charges that are completely ignored, quite frankly. I personally believe that Israel advocacy is an experiment the results of which are in, but that we conveniently choose to ignore because somewhere along the lines, it became something of an industry. There are a lot of people raising enormous amounts of money based on their ability to advocate for Israel. 
I'm willing to educate about the State of Israel. The viewpoint of our organization is that we will promote the State of Israel, we will support the State of Israel, but we're not going to advocate for our existence because we exist, we're proud of our existence, and we are certain that we're going to continue to go from strength to strength. So if that message resonates, anybody can invite us to anywhere. Now, when you go to campuses in the United States and indeed anywhere where you travel, uh, having had the experience myself of being on, on campus and seeing student um, demonstrations and student, uh, uh, you know, the BDS movement and Palestinians, can, it, it can seem very intimidating and they can be very vocal and some people say they've been shouted down by them. And so you're doing a very brave job in a way. Going, it's another war really with, the, with going into the situation and having to speak about the work of the IDF. Uh, how do you approach that and how do you, when you have to go onto a campus and you know there's going to be, um, you know, a little bit of friction when you, when you arrive? How do I approach it? I, I approach it directly. Directly. So anywhere where there might be calls for us to be banished from campus, those are the campuses to which we will go. Anywhere where students feel that they are unable to overtly support the states of Israel, regardless of their religious faith, regardless of their level of adherence to their particular religion, regardless of where they fall on the political spectrum, people ought to be able to speak to their support to the states of Israel openly. And by the way, that doesn't mean that I'm opposed to open and frank debate. You could bring another soldier here tomorrow who would espouse an entirely different series of opinions to anything that I might put forth. And incidentally, we do that in the IDF all the time as a matter of course when we serve together. And I welcome all of that. I truly believe in the importance of an open and free discussion and discourse with some basic parameters that I've already alluded to. Now with that having been said, I'm a combat veteran and I don't mean this to sound in any way self-aggrandizing because as I've said my service is absolutely average and in keeping with the service of many others here in the Israel Defense Forces but when I go to a campus after all nobody's opening fire on me nobody's trying to send a rocket toward me and there's a world of difference in my view when it comes to levels of intimidation I'm not going to be intimidated by a group of overzealous students on a particular campus holding signs, blowing whistles, chanting slogans, because I was frankly willing to move forward, as was every other member of my brigade, into the territory of Hezbollah in 2006, and I'm more than willing to move forward onto a university campus and face down these difficult charges. And by the way, I welcome the opportunity to do so. We have never been banished from any campus. We have certainly had disruption and intimidation attempted, but we have concluded our presentations always and will continue to do that. I do want to tell you, however, that we now are in a situation where we have to have a robust security presence on every campus at which we speak, whether it be a uniformed officer or a non-uniformed officer presenting. And that's usually comprised of the campus police who are uniformed, armed, and have the ability to remove and arrest anybody uh, who persistently disrupts. But frankly, our presentations proceed. It's unfortunate that it's arrived at this point, but I don't believe that that's something that is unique to a soldier of the Israel Defense Forces. Unfortunately, we've seen opposition to any discourse on any subject that leads back to the State of Israel. And I think that's unacceptable. If you've just tuned in, we've got uh, Sergeant Benjamin Anthony from Our Soldier Speaks, and uh, they can uh, go, they've got a website if the people are interested to know more information. And maybe you can tell us about uh, what the website address is. And uh... sure, the website address is OurSoldiersSpeak.org, www.OurSoldiersSpeak.org, and anybody wishing to know more about our work can visit that website. You can also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter and we'd be delighted to hear from anybody. Now, uh, you also, as well as um, working on campuses, you're also working in places like uh, the Senate in the United States, though. Yes, so we have three clear branches to our work. The first is our soldiers speak on campus. The second is our soldiers speak elite, and that's the branch to which you're referring. And the third is our soldiers speak educate, where we implement rigorous Israel history curricula 
at the core of the required learning within seats of Jewish high school education. That's a story in and of itself. If you care to ask me about that, I'd be happy to answer it. But to go back to your question, through our elite branch, we actually dispatch uniformed active officers up to and including at the rank of general to brief members of the United States Congress, the United States Senate, leading think tanks in Washington, D.C., leading law firms, anywhere that is influential when it comes to policy making on matters of security policy that relate to the state of Israel and oftentimes tie back to the security considerations of the United States of America. Now this is important because firstly again the officers are on uniform therefore they cannot wade into politics so there is no lobbying to this work and there is no political dimension to this work by law. Secondly many people find favor in the story of Israel but there are a lot of organizations, and I don't decry or diminish the importance of this work, there are lots of organizations that are involved in pro-Israel lobbying, and that's very positive and very important. But that lobbying is undertaken oftentimes by lay members of the community who are trained and taught as to what bullet points and talking points they should espouse in those meetings. That has its place, certainly, but that is not the same for example, as bringing the current commander of the Israel Air Defense Forces to speak on the ramifications of the Iran nuclear deal or the security of Ben Gurion Airport in the case that there's another conflagration with Hamas, whereby they might fire rockets towards there. And the members of Congress and the members of the Senate know that, and therefore they're extremely gracious and grant us audience for a far more pro pro protracted period of time. And what kind of feedback do you get? Do they? Uh... Do they tell you that they need this or this is, is it something you have to push through with? Or? No, we, we don't have to push through. People are very, very open. The United States is an incredible democracy. We have our contacts up on the hill. We regularly facilitate back-to-back -back briefings of course, uh, uh, across the course of two to three days. And we have repeat briefings that we undertake on an annual basis and we also make sure that we brief the staffers and the advisors to the members because they are no less important. They are the individuals to whom the members will turn for advice and counsel and for a, a phrase or a, a mission or a mission statement or a press release when it comes to hot button issues about the State of Israel. So we're very pleased to be working with them as well. We appreciate the fact that they assign their time to us. We deeply, deeply appreciate the fact that they grant as audience with the frequency that they do. And we don't anticipate it becoming more difficult. Rather, we anticipate the doors being increasingly more widely open to our work. Now, one of the, the issues that could arise is that when you have something like Operation Protective Edge or uh, 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 something that happens as an operation at the northern border, that you, uh, there's a call up We've seen that uh, uh, before when um, the soldiers are called up and they all have to go off and uh, people from this area where we're filming today have to leave their homes. And um, how is it for your organization? Because the very people you need suddenly are not, uh, do they have to be called up as well? So you, you don't have the opportunity to speak or? So that's a very important question because when I began my work in the United States, I oftentimes heard the idea that we're both involved in two battles. One is the military front and the other is the diplomatic front. And anybody speaking to the virtue of the state of Israel overseas is doing work that's just as important. That's for everybody to draw their own conclusions about. One can agree with that sentiment, one can disagree with it. I can only say on a personal level that on any occasion on which I am drafted, my first accountability is to the Israel Defense Forces. It's not to the speaking engagement that I might have the privilege of having been offered. And it is a privilege. I don't take any of those for granted, but nor do I take the existence of the State of Israel for granted, nor our security. And therefore, my first answer will always be to the call to be drafted. Now, does the organization persist during that time? Absolutely. And I'll express why. Firstly, we are proactive. We are not merely reactive and that means that our work is undertaken on an annual basis regardless of the events that are at play. So for example in 2014 we undertook a series of lectures 
in collaboration with the Israel Defense Forces, where we brought the senior advisor to the International Law Department of the IDF to present on the implementation of the laws of armed conflict against non-state actors. Now, this individual who holds a doctorate from NYU Law School presented on matters such as disproportionality in the eyes of the law, preventable casualties, collateral damage, and so forth. The students who were educated by way of that will be able to respond to charges of disproportionality through a legal prism when those come about, whether it be this year, next year, or the summer thereafter. So we actually have representatives there within the discourse who are able to speak to and refute various charges that may come about. In terms of whether we will be able to send active officers in times of war overseas, the answer is perhaps not. But the analogy I would use would be this. If an individual found themselves in the midst of a stabbing attack, they would first and foremost try to ward off that attack. Now, in, if in the midst of that attack, their GP was to approach them and say, Sir, Madam, I just want to talk to you about your cholesterol levels. Uh, that individual might well turn around and say, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the cholesterol in a moment. First, I have to deal with this threat to my very existence and survival. And I think that's something of the attitude that we apply. Mm -hmm. Which is something uh, unusual and perhaps uh, people, our audience may not appreciate the, the reality that Israel you know, when there's a time of uh, an operation like Operation Protective Edge, is a serious time, and um, yes. many people are caught up. Many, you know, we people don't realize that uh, shops, there's people missing, businesses don't function anymore. You know, taxi. There was a taxi driver who he's called up. He suddenly he wasn't there. If you you need the taxi, so suddenly uh, schools suddenly find that um, children are having difficulty because of parents. You know, want to getting them to school. So suddenly the whole of Israeli society changes when there's an operation. And I guess that we don't really realize that in the in the UK. Well, it's been great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm Thank sure I'm sure a lot of people uh, will uh, be going to visit the website and learn more about uh, the work of our soldiers speak. And I'm sure if you would like to help financially with that, there's also ways they can contact you and, and, and get involved and help. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Don't forget you can also visit our Facebook page, the In The Last Days TV uh, Facebook page. Uh, website is www.inthelastdays.com. We love to receive your emails. Thank you so much for those. Look forward to hearing from you. And remember, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In The Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter, get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you same time, same station for the next program from In The Last Days.